Captain here, you're watching Anderson's TV, and today I have the great privilege of welcome, welcoming even Josh Smith to the show. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you so much for having me, man. I'm really excited to be here. I can't believe how sprightly you are, given that uh, <laughs> we are both probably on LA time at the moment. Yeah. Uh, Josh flew in on Monday, I flew in yesterday, today yeah. is Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs> you are you are looking and sounding good, my friend. Thank you, man. No namthrax here. No namthrax, absolutely. No. No. Uh, so look, uh, tell us a little bit about, um, you know, I, I, I think you're one of the, the better known kind of country blues players on the scene, especially a, like, you know, like a real guitarist guitarist. Okay. Yeah. Um, but take us back uh, to, you know, growing up and your sort of early memories right. of, of um, what it was that drew you towards the guitar. Well, uh, my parents bought me a guitar when I was three years old. Uh, actually, the day my sister was born. It was like a surprise. She was born, and for some reason, my dad... Our birthdays are very close, so mm -hmm. it was kind of like my birthday got overlooked, my third birthday, because she was born two, like three days later. And um, I don't know. For some reason, on the way home from the hospital on the day my sister was born, my dad stopped and bought me a cheap little acoustic guitar and brought it home, like... At three years old? Three right? years old. Was it like a ukulele or something? Or just yeah, like just a, a little, no, six strings, but a little short scale nylon string, acoustic guitar, looked like a cowboy guitar, you know. Awesome. And, uh, I banged it around for a couple years, and when I was six, they say that I asked, like, to take lessons, that, I, yeah. you know, I wanted to learn. So I started taking lessons at six, and... Uh, yeah, that was kind of how it started for me. By the time I was 12, I was playing gigs with adults. You know, that was... What, and whereabouts was this? Where in you? Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Miami, okay. Fort Lauderdale, yeah, yeah. Florida. So good music scene out there? Um, there was. At the time, there was a lot of jazz because University of Miami used to be one yeah. of the top schools for jazz. Pat Metheny and Jocko yeah. and all that stuff going on down there. And uh, so my first teacher was like a jazz guy who graduated from UM. And so, yeah, there was a lot of good music and good musicians and... At the time, grunge was kind of what was happening, and I wasn't into it so much because mm -hmm. uh, my parents had good taste in music and the big big vinyl collection. <laughs> and so I grew up just my dad was all rock and blues, and yeah. my mom was all soul and R and B. So I, she, they had this huge vinyl collection of just great music that I yeah. heard. And so to play that music, none of the kids in my school wanted to do that. So I had to find adults to play with, yeah. and that that helped me like get better faster when I started playing with adults and getting out there and playing. Yeah. So, so at tw 12 years old, you're yeah. out doing what, smoky clubs and yeah, yeah, late smoky clubs and... where I couldn't even be there without my parents, you know, and <laughs> some of the clubs I could only be on the stage and I'd have to be outside on the break and things like that. And like if they didn't serve food, if it was just a bar, yeah, things yeah, yeah. like that. And uh, yeah, I mean, it sounds silly, but I got pretty good as a kid and started doing a lot of gigs and, and, uh, Derek Trucks was also from Florida, so we, we met each other very early on, and we used to play together a lot, like when yeah. we were 13 or 14 years old. <clears throat> yeah, he old. must be similar age, mustn't he? We're the same age. Same age, yeah. And uh, we've known each other, yeah, yeah, almost our whole lives. And we used to play clubs, like there was this one club, and Derek's from Jacksonville, which is further north in Florida. Yeah. But he would tour Florida, just like I would kind of on his weekends and yeah. spring break and Christmas break. And there was a club in Fort Lauderdale where he would come down and play that had two stages, and his band would play one stage and mine would play the other 
four sets each from nine till four in the morning. No So we'd way. go back and forth. We're 13, you know, and 14. And, <laughs> and, uh, I can't imagine. Can you, can you imagine how soul destroying it must be as a sort of, say you were like a 30 or 40 doing the best that you could on the guitar and you go to a bar and you see two 13 year old kids just destroying everybody. <laughs> it's like, it, was, it was weird. There was a lot of that at the time. Uh, a lot of guys my age who were starting to get their start. So it was like me yep. and Derek, Joe. I was about to say Joe, was, he was on the road. The first time 12, I, Joe 13. was actually, Joe's a couple years older than Derek and mm -hmm. I. I saw Joe play when he was 12. And he came down to Fort Lauderdale. Actually, we were just talking about this the other day because he found the poster from this blues festival, Riverwalk Blues Festival, where he played one of his first gigs. Yeah. And uh, I saw him at that gig, you know, and it was like, yeah, I can do that, you know. Well, that must have been a brilliant inspiration for someone who was, you know, 10 or whatever you were at the time. Yeah. To see a 12-year-old kid really, you know, tearing it, was, it up. It was certainly, like, a motivating, yeah. like, mm. you know what? If he can do it, I can do it. There's no reason I can't play with adults and, yeah. you know, be better than the average we, kid, you know. We met one of the kids from... Um, the, the, the School of Rock stage show yeah. out, out at the NAM show. And again, oh, yeah. again, same kind of thing, you know, I don't know how old he was. I think he's probably younger than 12, but you know, it's so great, inspiring to see young people get, you know, really, really, you know, taking the guitar seriously. Well, it was like, on one hand, I knew, you know, like, so, so this group of adults, I started going to jams and stuff, you know, you would sign a list and play yeah. a couple songs. And this, uh, this one jam I went to, a group of adults, they saw like, potential yeah. so they uh they signed me up like why don't you join our band you know i think they thought they could book more gigs by having yeah. a 13 year old kid <laughs> in the band which it, they did you know yeah. it worked out for everybody but i i i didn't care like i guess they were kind of taking advantage of me a little bit but i was just so excited to be playing gigs and uh be playing with adults like i just wanted to be I accepted bet. you know and so I was. Were you singing, was were you a, singing in that no or not just, yet no yeah. just you went i probably voice started singing around 15 right okay and it was painful at first. <laughs> <laughs> so who, could you remember there being like a, a standout influence to you in, in those days? Um, sure. Well, for me, first, it was uh, like B.B. King and Albert King. That was mm -hmm. my, my stuff for sure. Um, but then someone gave... Uh, Stevie died in 90. So in 90, mm -hmm. I was 10, you know. And I knew who he was, but I wasn't really hip yet, you know. Yeah. And... Then when I was 13, when I started playing gigs, I was just all Albert King, Albert King, Albert King. And someone gave me a VHS tape of Stevie Ray Live at the Alma Combo before it was an official release. Right. So it was a bootleg. And I remember putting, I so vividly putting it in the VCR when I got home with this tape and just losing my mind, you know, because not only did he play brilliantly, I'd never seen like a guy just like sweating like that and giving 110%, you know, yeah. and... That was definitely like a huge moment. Like, I want to do that, you know. And was he the sort of um, was he the sort of the first sort of inroads maybe into a little bit of the country influence that was coming in, or was not that quite another, yet. Another guy at that, that point, it was all blues. You know, yeah. it was it was BB King, Albert King, Stevie, Jimi Hendrix was big, obviously. Otis Rush, Magic Sam, um, and then. So Stevie, I got obsessed, and I started wearing a hat and grew my hair long, and and uh, shortly after that, there was like all these Steve guys just doing Stevie, you know. And I remember having a light bulb moment around 16, where I was at a festival with my band, and I had my Stevie Ray Strat, my hat, and then I saw another band with a guy doing the yeah. same thing, and it was like, <clears throat> I don't want to do that anymore. Yeah. I got to find my own thing. Whatever. That was that was a big moment. The country thing was a similar situation. Someone gave me a tape cassette not mm -hmm. vhs just an audio tape that had a mix of danny gatton on one side and this guy roy lanham on the other oh, side so familiar with roy him. lanham was like a california cowboy from right. the 50s but he was really a jazzer but okay. he played in the whippoorwills and the sons of the pioneers some like crazy 50s bakersfield right. type stuff so i put this tape in and i again lost my mind like danny gatton was the greatest thing i'd ever yeah. heard you know and that changed the way i played overnight because right. to pull off any of that stuff, it was like, oh, now I hybrid pick. Right. It just happened, you know, and uh, that was that was the big moment for for learning that type of stuff. And I still I don't consider myself like a country guy, but I just love those techniques so much, you know. And yeah. there's so much incredible Danny. The thing about Danny that stood out more than 
the vocabulary, which was immense, was that he was unafraid to play anything in any situation. He just played whatever he heard. And as I got older, I, I realized that the things that were most important to me were finding my own voice, but then also cultivating that voice into where, as an improviser, I was really honest like that in the way yeah. that I played. Like if I heard it, I played it yeah. because I really meant it, you know? And I heard that a lot in him. He had a sense of humor and yeah. he was willing to play anything. He, he, must have, he must have passed away when you were young then. So I'm guessing yeah, he, he never got to see he him He committed live. suicide yeah. in 94 was maybe. 94, yeah. So I was in high school already. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, I never got to see him live. Yeah. I think I remember I remember selling, you know, I was, I'd been working here for a couple of years by then and I remember he had a, um, who did the VHS tape? Was it Hot, hot Licks? Hot oh, yeah. Licks, yeah. He had Telly a, he had a hot, that's it. Yeah. And that was, I think that was the first time, because certainly in the, in the UK, the, the, and being a young guy in the UK, country would have been like the uncoolest yeah. kind of Even though Albert Lee to. though. Yeah, but but for young guys, I mean, not necessarily oh, yeah, as you it. got older. And, and yeah, I mean, Albert's probably our greatest ever sort of country export, isn't he? Yeah. Um, but I remember seeing this stuff and I had this moment where I was going, oh, somebody told me that like Steve Vai and Joe Satriani were the ones that had all the licks. And mm. then all of a sudden you start seeing the Danny Gattons and the Albert Lees and everything like that. And you're yeah. going like, whoa, now when, these when, guys have really got the chops. When I know? got that Hot Licks yeah. Telemaster, it was like, what? Because I'd never, there was no YouTube, you know what yeah. I mean? I started getting CDs. You used to have to go to a CD store when they still existed. Yeah. And they had a catalog, and I would order CDs. Like, so I would order the Danny Gatton catalog because yeah. they wouldn't have it in stock. You know, there was no Amazon, no none of that. Yeah. So it was like, I would get these CDs, but still I'd never seen them, you know? So then mm -hmm. I got the Hot Licks, and it was like, I still remember, there's like, Oh, this this is my like the first probably one of the first two five ones I ever learned. He goes, check out this list, Paul two five one. He's like, oh my god, I, like it was the coolest thing I'd ever heard, you know. And there's so many from that video that that I still are like in here, you know. Yeah. So, so how did your how did your mom and dad react when you said, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to carry on in high school and everything. I just want to go and be a guitar player. What? They were great. Grandparents, not so much. <laughs> uh, you know, I think they knew because I was, I was gigging so much mm. that uh, this is going to sound terrible, but I was, I, I was, I am kind of a smart guy. Like, I, I got good grades in school and I could have gotten a scholarship to school. I got really high on my SATs and all this crap. And, but I knew I had no interest. I was the guy who, did just as much work as I needed yeah. to do to get straight B's because that was yeah. easy for me because I, I knew I didn't care. I was just gonna go play gigs. You know, yeah. I was playing, at this point I was playing every weekend, every spring break and winter break and summer break, I was in a van on tour. I knew the second I graduated from high school that just meant yeah. I was getting in the van full time, you know? Yeah. And when I talked to teachers even about going to music school or this or that, they were like, you know, even some of them discouraged me. They were like, you know what you want to do mm -hmm. already, you know, it, and it's, there's nothing you're going to learn there that if you don't put in the hard work and time, you can't yeah. learn on your own either. And you're driven. So just, just yeah. start working, you know. So that was, so there was no um, sort of full-time formal music training for you. You just, everything no. was sort of self-taught or with, you know, one-to-one -one lessons. I took lessons until I was probably 15 and then mm -hmm. I was just gigging too much to, to continue taking lessons. And honestly, gigging on the job training mm. is where you grow the the fastest, you know? Yeah. Once you start taking the stuff on stage, it's like you just grow playing with guys that are better than you, you start growing leaps and bounds, you know, overnight. And there can't be many of those left, are there? <laughs> no, there's still plenty of them, you know? And that's why I'm I'm always searching out those situations though. Like how can like that's like how can I go play with John Schofield next? You know what I mean? Because I just want to be around guys who just will blow my mind, you know? What is it about, again, we'll, we'll come back to sort of gear and stuff, but the John Schofield one surprised me because he's a guy that has always, I found a little bit out there for me, but what, what is it about his playing that, that, that you like? Um, number one, he swings super hard, yeah. which to me is very important. Everything I, I play, I'm trying to swing and, because in the jazzy stuff that I do, it all comes for me from, from more bebop, Mm -hmm. Not not from very contemporary jazz. Yeah. I like 
Charlie Parker and Miles Davis and yeah. Dizzy Gillespie and that type of stuff. Wes Montgomery and Charlie Christian. So he has a lot of that with also some very complex mm. harmony. Maybe I've just been listening to the wrong stuff of his, but... Uh, Maybe, man. Listen to, yeah. like, if you want to get into to, to John and not get, like, freaked out by weirdness, listen to, like, the, the, the Ray Charles record he did. Okay. Or Piety Street, which is kind of a gospel record. Hell, his new record, that No Country for Old Men, or okay. Country for Old Men, is like country tunes where he's playing over it and it's brilliant stuff. Oh, yeah. Okay. He's... He has just an endless vocabulary, yeah, which is inspiring, you know. So you have now been what professional guitar player for must be over twenty years. Over twenty, I'm thirty eight. Right. So since I'm fourteen, like yeah, I've been playing guitar thirty one years, thirty two years. And when did it really feel like uh, you were getting the kind of recognition that you'd hoped for, and it was sort of you know huh. really sort of starting to take off for you? I still don't feel that way. <laughs> no, no, you know, it's an up and down thing. Yeah. Recognition and those type of things, it matters different amount of degrees to different people. Yeah. What always mattered to me the most was number one, could I support myself, mm -hmm. which is still shaky sometimes, <laughs> you know, ask my wife. And uh, number two was not so much, you know, to be super famous or make a lot of money, but I always wanted to have... The respect of my peers mm -hmm. was always very important to me. Like, I wanted it not to be apparent, but just for people. I wanted it, people to be able to realize that I'd put in the homework and yeah. done the time, and I take this serious. And so that that's was always the most important for me. And I started noticing a change in that after I moved to LA, probably mm -hmm. when I kind because of, so my whole journey was I did Josh Smith, Josh Smith, my own thing up until. I was about 22. Then I met my future wife, and I realized I needed to be an adult, mm -hmm. start paying bills, like for real. And uh, yeah, and uh, so I thought, well, I'll move to LA. You know, I'll just be a guitar player. Yeah. Uh, give up on this whole artist thing, and because I oh, knew I well, just to just to play for other people. You mean? Yeah, I thought hired gun. I'll just go be a, do sessions, yeah. do whatever I can. I knew I was a good enough player and knew yeah. enough music to to go probably do that you know play guitar so we moved to LA sight unseen no, no plans and uh, I wormed my way into this into that until till it became I was working you know and paying my bills and touring with different artists you know I toured with American Idol winners and uh, the last 10 years I've toured with this guy Rafael Sadiq which is a great gig and great mm -hmm. music and did lots of sessions and cool little things and that's been great and that's when I kind of noticed things shift I started getting known more, like before it was I was known in the blues world and as an artist. Now I was just getting known, I'm a guitar player. Getting known as a guitar player, yeah. getting in guitar magazines just for the way I play, not necessarily for my music, you yeah. know? And so I started seeing that shift happen. And then, yeah, over the last, I've been in LA 15 years, I would say the last six years, it started to swing back around again towards me doing my own thing more yeah. and more every year again now. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't know you had such a uh, a good career as a session player. I thought you'd always yeah. been like a solo kind of No, I, I did a lot of sessions. Mm -hmm. I still do. Now I have a studio of my own, and uh, so I do. I'm actually starting again to do more sessions than I had been doing for the previous few years because I've been doing them kind of the Tim Pierce method by mail where they just send them in and I do my thing and send it back, you know, and... Yeah, I know. I've done a lot of records a, and stuff. I mean, that's, I always think that's a fascinating change in, in um, just the way session musicians are employed now. You know, you, it doesn't matter what, even transatlantic stuff. I, I remember having a customer of mine uh, who was on all the pop records that seemed to get in the charts mm -hmm. like that. And, and I said to him, you know, it must be amazing meeting all these. He's like, you don't meet any of them. Yeah. <laughs> you just get an email going, here's a track. Can you play over this, please? And so you do it in the morning and you send it back and you get your fee. And it's totally it's different. It's done. It's like in the days of the records that you and I love, it was everybody sitting in a room together, yeah. playing together. Really easy. Now it takes much longer to make a record. That, you know, you, you're you're farming out every piece of yeah. it, you know, and guys are never in the same room together anymore. When I first moved to LA, the sessions I would, so the session thing for me was weird. I didn't know how to be a session guitar player at all when I moved to LA. I didn't know, I knew 
what I liked as far as tone goes and yeah. what I thought was good tone, but I didn't know like how to get any other tone other than my tone, you know, wow. which was like, that was a big learning curve. Like when you go to a session, they don't care what you sound like as Josh Smith. They care like, can you get the tone that's right for the track or what yeah. they're asking you to get, you know? Yeah. So that was a big learning curve. Um, making friends with Mike Landau was a big on that. Uh, he was he gave me a lot of advice for some reason he he liked me and um he would sometimes recommend me for sessions that he couldn't do if he was double booked or things and nice. yeah kirk too he would recommend yeah. kirk and yeah. you know mike, mike mike's a great guy and um so one time he recommended me for the session and not to say that i bombed it but <laughs> i didn't feel like i did great you know i had just it wasn't not long after i'd been to in la yeah. and I still, like, I didn't know. When you walk in, someone maybe puts a chord chart in front of you. If it says 1625, I didn't know, like, I had to make up a part, not just play those chords. So mm -hmm. it's not like that I played anything wrong, but I didn't know the job of being a session musician yet, you mm -hmm. know? So I asked Mike, could I follow him along to a session? And I carried his stuff for him and watched him do a session, and it was an eye-opener because it was like as he listened down while he's even setting up, I could tell he was getting ideas. So when it came time to play, it was like, he didn't just play. He maybe played. Yeah. Whatever, he had some idea, some part, some something. It might not be the right one, but he had an idea already, yeah. you know what I mean, for what he was gonna do. So it was, you start learning that. Then you start learning, shit, what if they asked me to get the U2 sound? I didn't know how to get the edge delays. I, 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 I barely used delay ever in my career as a solo artist until then because it wasn't my thing. So it was like, I had to figure out, oh, it's a dotted eighth note and a quarter note. And how do you do that? And, you know, so I never used a Vox amp until I moved to L.A. Like, but when someone asks you to get a Beatles sound or a Tom Petty sound, I had to have one. So you start like figuring out all these new tools you need and all these techniques you got to learn. And that, that was well, a big part of being a session guy. Well, that is a seamlessly smooth transition into talking about gear. So yeah. well done. That yeah. was normally my job to steer it in that way, but you've done it Thank perfectly. Yeah. Um, so everybody's going to want to know kind of, you yeah. know, sort of like the history of your gear and what it is about uh, the, yeah. the Telecaster, I think that, you know, you seem to be naturally drawn to. But so, okay. so what do you want, you know, what was the, I guess, what was the first, uh, you know, it doesn't matter whether it was an amp or a guitar or whatever, or even a pedal. Yeah. The first thing that you know when you were when you were uh, forging as a, as a as a young guitar player that you went, I think I found my sort of soulmate or my tone or my my thing. The know? first one was my Stevie Ray Strat for right. sure. That was my first like this is my baby number yeah. one. You know, I saved so <laughs> don't laugh. I had a Charvel with a Floyd Rose. Uh, red with black crackle finish. That was my main electric Would guitar. Would never have said no, that in I, a million years. I still have it. Yeah, it's, it's, this is Josie's favorite It's, it's in my parents' house. You know, I still got <laughs> Amazing. it. Amazing. Single, single hum. And, uh, and, uh, yeah. and um, once I started playing gigs, I knew, like, because I didn't know anything about it. I was a kid. I didn't yeah. know tone. I didn't know pedals. I didn't, so I knew I needed a different tone, Was especially once I started listening to Stevie. Yeah. So I was playing gigs saving $75 in an envelope after every gig, you know. And we went to this music store that I grew up going to, and they had a Stevie Ray Strat. It had just come out, you know, yeah. the Stevie Ray Signature okay. Strat. The black one with the SRV on the scratch. Sorry, the black pick guard The sun bar with the black yeah. SRV and the left yeah. trim, the left yeah. hand of the trim and the whole deal. So I started saving to buy yeah. that guitar. And that was the first, like, first guitar I bought basically with my own money from gigs. And so I was in love with that guitar, yeah. obsessed with it. And uh, I had that. I bought a pro re a silver face pro reverb was my first serious amp for gigging. Okay. I had no idea even about pedals or distortion because up until that point I'd only had practice amps that had yeah. distortion built into them, yeah. like a crate and a Ross and a this and that. So I remember the first gig before I had the Stevie Strat, I took the Charvel and the pro reverb for the first time to the gig, and it was like why do, I, don't, I can't get any distortion out yeah. of this amp. I was plinky 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 and. So was, my friend was like, you gotta go get a pedal now if you're gonna use that amp. And I was like, oh, okay. So went down and bought a Boss uh, Turbo Distortion. Yes. Or no, Turbo Overdrive. Yeah, turbo yeah. Overdrive, yellow <laughs> one. That was my first pedal, Boss Turbo Overdrive. And then I <laughs> I remember I, I was like, I need a Wawa pedal. 
and I let the guy at the store talk me into the DOD Wah volume, the little weird gray one. It was the worst pedal I ever owned. <laughs> I, I returned it after one gig and was like, what's a regular Wah? And he gave me a Vox Wah. Yeah. And I was like, those were the first pedals I ever had. That was the beginning of it for me. And have you, I mean, obviously it sounds to do all the session work uh, yeah. that you've done. You've built up quite a collection of, of gear over have, the years. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, for a while now, I think, yeah, I mean, you've been a big Morgan fan, haven't you? That must be I've at been least five using years, maybe more. more than that. I've yeah. been using Morgan like um, at least seven years, maybe. Yeah. And how yeah. how did you first meet uh, Joe or get into his amplifiers? Um, I met Joe because at the time, my favorite combination of amps is Super Reverb and AC30. Yeah. Once I hit upon that, that became like, this is what I like. I think this is my sound that I was right. looking for. So I had a kind of boutique super at the time made by Fargen amps, Ben Fargen, okay. friend of mine from California. I liked it a lot. Mm -hmm. And I wanted some sort of trustworthy boutique Vox to take mm -hmm. on the road with that. And at the time, you know, you had Matchless and Bad Cat. Matchless was super expensive and mm -hmm. Bad Cat didn't do it for me when I tried mm -hmm. them. Not that they aren't great. So Joe had just started making amps out of his garage and on the gear page, you know, I heard about him and he's, I'm in LA, he's in Huntington Beach, it's an hour, you know. I called him up and uh, I said, dude, can I come try out your amps? And he was like, yeah, of course. So actually Kirk and I drove down and uh, I plugged in and it was like, yeah, this is exactly what I'm looking for, this AC30, yeah. it was 40, to go with my Subaru. But once you meet Joe, you know it's like, without question, in this entire industry of music gear people that I know, he's the the one who's actually like my real friend. Like, yeah. just instantly, we were just friends, and he's just such a great guy that not shortly after that, it became, man, I just want to use your amps. Can you build me this? Can you build me this? So that's what happened. Next, he built me the GOAT, which is my main amp, the JS40, which is a super with the three-knob yeah. reverb. and. Then he built the first PR-12 he built me because with Raphael we were playing on the Grammys with Mick Jagger. And I said, dude, I want to use two small tweed amps on, on the Grammys that look sexy, but let's yeah. have your light on the front. I was like, can you make me a Princeton Reverb but tweed? And then maybe like a Prince uh, a tweed, not deluxe, but lower power, like a tweed Princeton. Yeah. And he was like, yeah, we'll just make them and sell them after the gig. So, so he made the tweed Princeton and the Princeton PR-12. And I used them on the Grammys. I kept the PR-12. He sold the tweed yeah. one. That was the first PR-12. Uh, a PR-12 is probably our best-selling Morgan amplifier, but it's a killer, killer sounding amp. It's the amp I use every yeah. day. Every session, yeah. every small thing, grab and go. Uh, yeah. the, the GOAT is my main amp, but in all, so all honesty, ever, the PR-12 is really my main amp because it gets used the most. I've definitely never seen a GOAT in the flesh. There, uh, there's only, besides mine, yeah. I have two. There's probably only five other ones around. People have ordered them. They get them and they, uh, it's too loud for people. <laughs> no master, 40 watts, it's loud. And yeah, that is loud. I like it loud too. Like we bias it so it's clean head. I like headroom, you know? Yeah. Well, look, I mean, that's cool. That's probably the, the gear I'm most familiar with you with. Actually, I haven't said that though. I'm just trying to think. I mean, the Tachula. How do you even the pronounce Chula that? The Tula is Chula. So yeah, there's, Chula. the T is silent, is it, in the Tula? Yeah. There is, like is Chula, it? Mississippi. It's a city in ah, Mississippi. Ah, I see. It's just random. Sean from Love Pedal. That's like a stamp, like a postage stamp. And, oh, okay, uh, cool. He bought it like in a secondhand store in Chula, Mississippi. Yeah. But that's so that's a cool pedal. But take us through um, uh, this is your touring. This is my most recent touring board that Dan from Gearing yep. put together. Uh, so I have the G2 as my main switcher, the brains of the operation. And then uh, there's the Chula, the King Tone Duelist, which is Jesse Davies, the Deep Trip BOG Fuzz, which is incredible, Eventide H9, which is my jack of all trades and yep. the main, main session pedal. Best session pedal ever made, quite honestly. Down here I got a Catlin Bread Echo Rec, oh, which yeah. is my favorite vibey delay kind of. Yeah. Love pedal Purple Plexi, which doesn't get used a lot on gigs. It's more for sessions. It's my power cord Marshall yeah. pedal. Yeah. TC Flashback Mini, just solely for the purpose of having my tone print on there that I made this slap. And then uh, the Love Pedal Believe, which is my octave pedal. 
It's great. And we'll do a sweep of this uh, so you guys can kind of see inside. So uh, this is one of these uh, Schmidt Oh, yeah, and the board is a Schmidt boards, array. Yeah, from uh, Germany. Which I've toyed with stocking once or twice, but I They're can't super quite cool, bring myself. Man. I think it's about a thousand bucks just for the board, this one, isn't it? It's like I can't believe that once, once Dan wired this up, like you see, it's got the little aluminum lid and all that yeah. that goes right on. It kind of looks like you're carrying the nuclear codes yeah. through the airport. <laughs> it's so heavy duty and well thought out. But I mean, there's almost as much on this board as on my big Bradshaw board. Yeah. And I can put this in the overhead on the plane. Like yeah. I carry this on the plane. It's it's so great. Can we hear some? Um, yeah. Some of the different pedals in isolation. So maybe, so or? the Chula first is the main thing. So I'll just briefly say, the main thing about tone for me, in everything I use, from the big strings to the cables I like to the pickups and everything is. How much dynamics can I have? Mm -hmm. Losing compression. Get get compression out of there. Compression's an effect. I'll use it if I want to, but I, I normally don't want yeah. any in my signal so that I can do this, you know, so I can change my volume and change my pick attack and yeah. get dynamics. So the Chula, the reason why it's my favorite pedal ever is because it's without question the most dynamic pedal I've ever played. I mean, the main side has no knobs, you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's because I asked for it that way. It's based on the COT50, yeah. which just has one knob. And the initial idea was I said, Sean, can you make me a double COT50, but preset the main one the way that I always set it. Right. So that's what's on the left side. What, are you running that on like 18 volts or something? No, get the, no, just regular. No, just it's on a battery down. actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Only carbon batteries from, Eric Johnson ain't crazy. I hear the difference <laughs> in the battery. But yeah, so I got the battery supply. We're uh, going to talk about that because yeah. I, I never even, I've just discovered this battery supply thing whilst <laughs> I was at the NAM show. It's completely freaked me out. We'll talk about that in a minute. For anyway. drives, it's a game changer. Right. But anyway, so the first side of the Chula, if you've heard me play in the last 10 years, which is, that's the 10th anniversary Chula. Wow. You haven't heard me without this pedal. Yeah. It's 98% of the time. That's yeah. all you hear is me. So here's Strip and this. But the thing is, it cleans up. If I just roll back my volume, it's still on. Even all the way up, I can play Quinn and then just. And the louder the amp is, the more dynamic it is, you know. So it doesn't have a ton of gain, but the louder you play, it's it's more than enough for me. Yeah, you know. For sure. So for that's sure. that's that is my sound. Usually it's that, or maybe that with the slap from the TC, which is this. Yeah, it's just really dynamic and organic and reacts to the volume and to my picking the way that I like. And It's such an iconic Telecaster sound that as well, isn't it? It's just... It a lot of guys great. don't get don't get it. I'll get messages from guys all the time like, I bought a Chula because of you and I, how do you deal with the volume boost? And I say, it never comes off. So I don't have to deal with the volume boost, you know, or... It's too bright, and I'm like, well, are you playing at like one watt? And you're, you know, because it, it is bright if you're sitting it through like no volume. Yeah. It needs some juice, you know what I mean? But it's a gigging man's pedal for sure. It does sound good. What do you, what do you use the other side for? Just for a little goose sometimes. So the cool thing is, I had him take the second side, and instead of just making it, they don't stack, so it's just one or the other. Right. So instead of making the second side the exact same as the first side, but with a knob. It's the exact same as the first side, but the knob range is limited. So actually, even with the knob all the way down, it's a slight boost from where one is. So right. basically, this is set internally like this, just below half. So in all actuality, when I switch to this side, if the knob's all the way down, it's really like going from there to there, yeah. straight up. So it's, it's a slight boost, I'll show you. So... I normally there's not a lot of range in it yeah so i just use it to go over the top so. 
It's a great pedal. So the um, tell me a little bit more about the Duelist as well. This uh, it's got some very dumbly. So the Duelist, the Duelist, we got to go Strat if we're going to. Okay, the Duelist. let's do that. Let's switch. It's got over. some dumbly looking knobs and string singer words on there. I'm the um, guy who doesn't mind if you have a pedal on the board that you only use with one guitar. You know <laughs> what I mean? So the Duelist is that for me because. Two Screamer E pedals, Yeah, I don't use with a telly, you know what I mean? They just don't work for me with a telly. But with a Strat, there's something special about that, you know? So basically the Duelist has two sides. String Singer, Two Screamer. Yeah. Heavy Hand, which is more like a Marshall okay. Blues Breaker type sound. I don't even use it. Oh, okay, so you <laughs> I just, just use this, it. it's, the, the right side is so brilliant, and it has this switch glass, flat, yeah, yeah. and fat. Yeah, and, uh Glass is like a TS-10, which is my favorite. Right. Like, it's the most Stevie sound. Stock is like a TS-9. Fat, to me, is a little more like an 808. Okay. So, here you go. That's Chula, sorry. So, they're straight in, right? Strat, here's this. Like, oh. right? Just the sound, right? <laughs> I like the little rundown. That's very Stevie, that thing, wasn't it? That's it just has that sound, you know what I mean? It's, 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 it's like with a Strat and that, it's just got... <laughs> It's like, it's the best Strat pedal I've ever heard. It's the best cure for jet lag ever. That's what you need to do. Never mind <laughs> trying to just get some sleep or anything like that. Just invite Josh Smith to come around and take you through his pedal board. Um, so that stays on the board just for when I play a Strat. And actually having that pedal, I, don't, I haven't had it that long, is making me play a Strat more than I have in 15 years. I'm going to come back to asking you what, what the actual guitars are yeah. um, in, a, in, a, in a second. But um, this bog fuzz thing so, yeah i mean fuzz is tricky it's tricky isn't it i've never i've never known a a kind of pedal where it becomes so personal in the sense of it's oh, yeah. it's, it's got to it's got to match the player the guitar the amp the other pedals on the board um i think it's a tough one to hear someone else using a fuzz and go oh it sounds amazing i'm gonna buy one of those because well yeah because it won't work for you then no way. you it's, know what i mean so personal well also it? it's i mean whatever pickups you have in your guitar it's gonna load it in this weird way yeah. you never know if it's the right one for your yeah. setup you know and so have you, have you been through a bucket load of i've fuzz been pedals? through a lot i have i have a great vintage fuzz face with yeah. nkt 275s in it a gray one yeah which has been my benchmark you know and my favorite fuzz the last six, seven years has been the Burkos Third Stone, which is a guy from L.A. who's right. making fuzzes. And it's been my favorite, but it's just not quite loud enough. Because like I was saying earlier, the Chula is really loud and has yeah. a high boost. And because I have it on all the time, when I take it off and switch to any other dirt yeah. pedal, normally they sound quieter than the Chula. Is that, is that because most... Fuzz pedals that the, the kind of vintage circuitry doesn't add any kind of real boost. Exactly, it just, yeah. It just even all the it. way up, they're yeah, like barely like, unity. It's almost unity, you know isn't I mean? it? Yeah. So this guy has done you something, or has made something with tons of extra. This is headroom. a silicon fuzz. It's a little more tweakable. It has yeah. a lot of sounds, and it has more volume to it. I just, I really like this fuzz. Uh, I also have a new fuzz that I've designed with Vemaram coming out. And uh, that fuzz is serious. Yes, like we. Uh, yeah. I was saying to Josh, we, we, Vemuram was one of the. We went to the stand a couple of times at the NAM show, and we could never. It was busy every single time. Yeah, the, uh, yeah. Tomo, um, what's his surname again? Fujita. Tomo, Tomo Fujita. Fujita. Uh, he was on the, the the stand the second time we went, and uh, yeah. understandably, you know, we didn't want to go. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. No. Um, so I saw that your pedal, but I didn't. I didn't get to hear it. The pedal so. is. It's an interesting pedal. It's kind of a pedal I've wanted for like ten years. It's not mm. just a fuzz. Yeah. It's a fuzz with a parallel loop and a parallel. It's some stuff that I've been wanting for a while. But oh, well, the fuzz part of it is some ideas that I've had for a while as well. It's germanium and silicon. 
the transistors are in parallel. You can bias both outside on the pedal. Right. So you can set one hot and one cold and they react in a certain way. So it's a very, oh, again, cool. very dynamic, which is yep. what I'm always looking for. Well, when we get that in, we'll, we'll do a little run through that separately. Yeah. But for now. Yeah, so here's, uh, let's have a listen to this. the other thing about the BOG, the BOG, it's really good into a clean amp. So like here, I'll put the, fl the slap on so you can hear it. And here's what the fuss. not that how can i describe it it's not that oh, super saturated fuzzy yeah. kind of it's almost it's just enough to i keep you, the fuzz just so it doesn't get that i yeah. keep, i get as much just as little gain as i need to get yeah. that sound because it's given it almost yeah. that sort of almost like violin-y kind of thing rather than yeah. maybe yeah i don't know you hear some players eric johnson i think has mu a much more almost kind of like a synth organ sound. Well, yeah, he's got darker fuzz. and darker yeah. and darker and darker. Um, but that sounded fantastic. Well, what's cool is this has the bias on the outside. It also has the high and low control, so mm -hmm. you can really tune it really well. But like, even just the bias, if I turn the bias down, it's way speedier. <laughs> So I, I like a little yeah. bit of that. So I, I but if I bias it high, it'll be smoother. Then you need more fuzz. It's just well, really good. I know? think where you had it before, so that first sound sounds. Oh yeah, fantastic. see, I like the volume like that, gain like that. Plus, it, like if I hit it with the chula too. Did you put it's, the Chula before or after the fuzz? The Chula is after the fuzz. After, so it's just more so like a level, level boost. boost yeah. yeah. Oh, man. I like fuzz early on. And yeah. I like Chula early on, too, but fuzz before the Chula. Um, that's superb. Now, I think the even side, are you, what are you using that for? Because your reverb's coming lots. from the amp, right? Normally, but sometimes I have other reverbs, uh, depending on songs. The even side, I use twofold. So, like, for, for my stuff... It's all about specific parts. So, you know, parts of a song, sounds that I need. In the studio, it's the ultimate because it has every sound, yeah. sounds great, and you control it with your iPad. So I have yeah. my iPad sitting on my music stand. Yeah. I don't have to bend down. And if a producer says, hey, have you got, yep, I've got, you know, whatever you need, I've got, you know. And so on the G2, I had Dan make it where one switch, no matter what bank I'm in or anything, is dedicated to. When I hit this one, it turns it to the Leslie and turns it on. So, so that's one of the main sounds. So I have like a dedicated Leslie pedal, even though it's in the H9, you know what I mean? So that's one I use a lot from the H9. Uh, the easiest way is just to go through presets like this instead of going through songs. So here's a different Leslie. Oh no, that's a delay. But that's like for a song of mine. And this everything is, in the front end of the amp? If I'm everything like front yeah. end of the amp. None of my amps have loops. There's a different Leslie, a darker one that I use for, for a certain thing. I have a, a spring for when I, when I don't have an amp with reverb. Yeah. This is cool. This is a ring mod that I use sometimes. Oh really? That I have the mix way down. So yeah, it yeah. sounds like. Like, what would you use that for? <laughs> I like it, like, put a fuzz on and play bebop with it. 
I just like it's like slightly dirty. It you hear it in the weird, background like, a little bit. Broken in the background. That's a Schofield thing for sure. Right, right. Uh, here's a slap for when I want the Eric Johnson thing. That's kind of his yeah. slap. So. <laughs> Asking for trouble right there. May not do that. Uh, this is like a backward sound that I got. Uh, what else we got? This is my intro for my song Penance, which is. to songs of mine and stuff like that you know but it, it does so much you know? and and underneath i think the only we've heard this the flashback you said you had a plexi that you just kind of used yeah sort of so the here's uh, stuff. Uh, i also have the echo rec so that's yep. this to get out of your way when you're playing. I don't yeah. like ones that take over your sound, you know? The Echo Rec has always worked for me. From the yeah. second I got it, it just, that pedal works, you That's know? That's a great sound. Uh, also got the Believe down there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is like a clean octave kind of, and right. I like it for certain reasons I'll show you. So here's just, just the Believe by itself. <laughs> So it's cool. It's like you can play, unlike an Octavia, you can play down here. It just doesn't, doesn't work only above the 10th yeah. fret. Also, you can use bridge pickup. It doesn't take your head off. You can get synthy with it almost. And you can almost chord with it. It's actually more of a ring mod than an Octavia. Yeah. So the other reason I like it clean like that is then I can combine it to get different sounds. So if I put the chula with it, you get... If I put the fuzz with it, then it's more of an Octavia. I put the duelist with it, it's a kind Ooh. of a different sound, you know? Yeah, so that's why I like that. Uh, the Purple Plexi is my favorite Marshall yeah. type pedal. One of my favorite things about it, let me make sure I, I changed the settings the other night, so let me make sure I'm good. Yep. <clears throat> One of my favorite things about it is it's super loud. So sometimes on stage, you end up in a situation where you can't get above what's going on. Yeah. That pedal always gets me above <laughs> anything. That's, it's like my secret. If I, like especially, say you're sitting in with other guitar players, or you got ten guys on stage and you're getting buried. <laughs> that pedal gets me up above the the the, the fray. So, anyways, uh, here's straight in. I have the gain almost all the way down. Yeah, with a Les Paul, it's so like fat. Yeah. It? Yeah, with a Les
Les Paul is like really good that Sounds Marshall immense. thing. The other cool thing about the Purple Plexi is it it's very amp like it cleans up it's like all the love pedal stuff is yeah. just so dynamic but it also takes pedals really good it, it's almost okay. like you turn the front end of your amp into a plexi and then like if i put the fuzz into that right like if i put the fuzz with like the echo rec into that it's like Like a fuzz into a Marshall at that point, you know what I Sounds mean? Sounds great. Yeah. It's pretty quiet as well, your board, in the sense pretty of like, quiet, you know. Yeah. For, anyway. Good power. Good. I'm going to talk stuff. about this battery thing because we met Mason from Vertex for the sa first time at yeah. the NAM show, and I, I've always heard the the Eric Johnson battery uh, yeah. stories. Uh, and we had Eric Johnson here a few years ago. Got to meet his guitar tech, and, mm -hmm. and you know, and I, to be honest with you, that's actually probably the least weird. Eric Johnson story there is because the battery thing actually does you can oh, hear yeah. that can't you um, so yeah so Mason had made this thing and you, you were saying it was kind of it sounded like it was like your idea but this this it was my this idea. power supply where you you put nine volt batteries in it you hook up your pedals to it and then the power supply works out kind of when the pedals on or off so it only yeah. provides juice when the pedals on and then when it's off it takes it from the power supply or something weird no like it has a saying. relay right Basically, the pedals, the pedal, you know, you turn off and on however you will. Yeah. The batteries turn on, they, you take a tap from your other power supply, like from a Voodoo yeah. Labs or yeah. whatever. And then when you when that supply comes on, it knows to turn the batteries on. So when you unplug your board, it turns the batteries off. So you don't have to unplug like yeah, yeah. the input jack from yeah, the pedals yeah. you want to use batteries yeah. on. And then you don't have to ever open the the pedals anymore to change the batteries. So like in this one, I have the original version of that box. Uh, 15 years ago, I got, when I moved to LA, I got a Bradshaw rack. I yeah. wanted one my whole life. I searched out Bob Bradshaw and got this rack, right? So I was already starting to become obsessed with this stuff. And I had gotten my first COT from yeah, Sean. Yeah, yeah. And I noticed when I plugged it into a power supply, I didn't dig it as much as okay. with the battery. I said, man, what's going on with this? And he goes, well, the battery that's in there is carbon. And I said, really? And he's like, yeah, like those really cheap dollar batteries. And I said, so it's, it's, it's not like an alkaline battery. He's like, no, it's really crappy. And I said, okay. So they're the ones you get at the dollar store. You know? I so, don't even know, you can you even buy carbon batteries over here anymore? Like here, everything's Duracell or Superpower, yeah. everything, isn't it? But I go to, to the dollar store and get, they're called Heavy Duty or whatever, and I get, I buy them 99 cents each. And That's crazy. I also man. order them from this website, batteriesandbutter.com, <laughs> that sells only batteries and butter. And, uh, yeah. Only in America. I know. Awesome. I Maybe buy 100 Russia. at a time, 100 of these batteries. So anyways, the reason carbon sounds good only it's only with dirt i don't care yeah, about yeah. any other pedal yeah. but with especially fuzz and dirt because a carbon battery is in a little bit of a way like a tube um it's very inconsistent and very sensitive to power so and to the input so like you know how when you hit your amp hard sometimes mm -hmm. if you look at the tubes you'll see them the, yeah, yeah, the yeah, light yeah. go down and up the battery is the same way the carbon battery so when you hit the pedal really hard it sags down and then comes back. And they also last a long time. Yeah, yeah. And but Mason was saying with the, uh, if you use it with the power supply thing, you can get about 100 hours out of a yeah, battery, which, yeah. is, which is good going, isn't it? So, oh, the, so the one in there is the first one that Bob Bradshaw made for me. Then when I started working with Mason after that, he made it into a much nicer professional looking yeah, thing yeah, with four yeah. slots instead of three with the relay so that the this one used to have a switch on it that i would have to remember to shut it oh, off at the end of every show so if i didn't yeah. shut it off my batteries would be dead the yeah, next yeah, day yeah. you know yeah. what i mean so actually when i did this board with dan i sent him that original bradshaw one right and he added a relay to that so that i this one shuts off and cool. all. Yeah. right we're going to move on to your guitars now all right i'm going to take a bathroom break if you don't Let's mind do just that, very yeah. quickly so I, I mean, it seems bizarre that we've got to this last, seeing as the guitar really <laughs> should be kind of like the, the, the first thing. But right. um, can I grab the, the your? Of course. So this is this is number one right I feel here. Feel bad calling this a Telecaster. I mean, yeah. I know it is, but it's, it's not called a. Fender, a he so. calls it a T bird, shape and T bird. So, oh my goodness, me! The reason I asked Josh to pass me this was because you know 
he is fairly well known for using kind of crazy heavy strings. Yeah. Not in 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 concert tuning as well. So yeah, in concert, yeah. I'm not going to get more than the. I get one one tone. Can you bend more than it? Well, I'm sure you can. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Wow, I'm not going anywhere near that. But anyway, come on then. So let, let's, let's so, okay. Tell us about these two and, and well, this this has been my number one for 12 years now. Made by Bill Chapin, who used to be in California, but now he's in Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. He's kind of the prototypical mad genius, one man lone wolf builder. Kind of you, we all know a lot of those guys, you know. Uh, he really is kind of a genius. This was the second guitar he built for me. The first was a Strat because basically my whole life i played strats not knowing that i was a telly guy in denial and once i got this guitar it all changed for me like i i had had other tellies but never the right one you know so anyways bill just has this thing about once he meets you and hears you play maybe builds you one guitar then he really knows you okay. and the next one it just not that's supposed to be like the, the, the sort of the Howard Dumble vibe, isn't it? It is a little bit like, like for... that. He's a, he's a little bit of a genius. Like so, this guitar, just the second I got it, it was like, bam, that's me. I've been waiting my whole life for that guitar, and there it is. And Bill is the kind of guy that will use parts available if they're the right part, and if they're not, he'll make what needs to be right. made. So it's like this has a Lawler pickup in the neck because he liked it and it yeah. worked with his guitar. Yeah. This bridge pickup he wound himself because he couldn't get anything to do what he wanted to do. He voices like each cap for each pickup and the pots. Uh, he voices everyone. It's like he changes and changes and gets it the way he wants, even the switch and things like that. And this guitar, also everybody asks when the, I've had people order copies of this guitar from him, mm -hmm. and they always assume it was a relic. And no, this guitar looked brand new when I got it. It's just a very thin coat of yeah. black, one coat, you know, and. It's pretty much it, a straight 50 style telly. It's ash it's body. Little, it's kind of a soft V, isn't it's, it? On the I like V. Yeah. I like that. You'll, so, this is a 57 style strat. Right. Which was always my dream guitar. Yeah. V neck. That's what I like. Yeah. Yeah. So, this is one piece maple neck, ash body, compound radius, though, okay. which I really like. Mm -hmm. It's like nine and a half to 11. Yep. And uh, yeah, 13 through 58. For the strings. Have you had that modified, or is this the original like seven and a quarter inch radius on here? Or this is is a uh, seven two five radius, yeah. yeah, vintage radius. So, do you find it very different swapping between the two, or not? I'd like to say yes, but no, but no, no. <laughs> no. I like this better. This times, this sometimes on the E, you you know you'll go over the edge a little bit, or you'll yeah. fret out, but yeah, not really. When a guitar's set up properly. It, it works, 725. You left the stock pickups in this one, or have you changed these? Okay, without getting anyone into trouble, this is not a Fender guitar. <laughs> uh, this was made by a friend. We'll just ignore this part. <laughs> and um, I shouldn't say his name then. But uh, the long story on this guitar is uh, a 57 Strat had been my dream guitar my whole life. Yeah. Ten years ago, I found the best one I'd ever played. A real one. Original. Yeah, but okay. at the time the vintage market was at the highest. It was forty grand. It was Woo. completely original. Anyways, the guitar it was in Chicago. Sat there for a while, then got sold. I thought I'd lost track of it. Flash forward to a few years ago, I'm in Chicago again, talking to my friends at Chicago Music Exchange, and they're telling me, "Hey, we're getting back a '57 Strat that we sold around that time. It could be your guitar." I'm like, "Really?" So of course the next day I come back, we open the box. It's that guitar. So I lose my mind. And like a dummy, I post the story on Facebook. Like, isn't this amazing? It may be my dream guitar. It's meant to be. It's the best guitar I ever played. Someone bought it out from under me. It was just like that because I said it was the best guitar ever. So anyways, it's gone. So my friend Ron Ellis, who's a brilliant pickup maker, knew, knew that story. And unbeknownst to me, when I was going through some tough times last year, some family stuff, yep. um, he had a 57 Strat in his possession not that one but he had one and it was a good one and he basically went to his friend mark they live close <coughs> to each other and he said hey i want to make a copy of this 57 strat and give it to josh as a present and not tell him so they didn't even tell me they just made me this guitar ron wound the pickups he even beveled all the pole pieces exactly like the 57 that they had yeah. sitting there at the time and they gave me this guitar as a present to cheer me up 
and it's become mm, my lovely. favorite my favorite strat for sure it's it's incredible yeah and and this is all this is all this is all since i got it just you know white it was a plain white guard and i've yeah, I was actually surprised how dirty it got. Yeah, because it's so not, fast. not that old, is it? This one. It's, no, it's a couple years, yeah. two years old. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. This is a great strat. These pickups are crazy good. You mentioned uh, while we were going through your pedals, one of them sounding particularly fat with a Les Paul. But I mean, do, do we often see? I'm just trying to think if we've ever Les really Paul. Seen yeah, you. I've actually in the last few years, for the first time ever, yeah. played a Les Paul a good amount. Yeah, there's a story behind that too. <laughs> so I was never a Les Paul guy, but. Joe Bonamassa is one of my good friends. Yeah. And I hang out with him a lot. And I've got to play a lot of his. He's obviously got many real ones. He's got ones. a few, yes. yeah. Yeah. So they, they, you know, were great. So they started to open my eyes to, mm -hmm. wow, this is special. But also, he's got 10s or 11s on there. And I'm just playing them through his rig or at his house. It's not the same as playing through your rig on a gig to really yeah. get a feel for a guitar yeah. with your strings and your setup. Anyways, I'm in Germany two years ago, and my friend Detlev owns a vintage shop in Germany called Guitar Point. Mm -hmm. He's also a friend of Joe's. Whatever, we talk, and he's coming down to one of my shows, and he has about four bursts in mm -hmm. his shop at the time. And he says, hey, Josh, would you like it if uh, I set one up with 13s, and that way you could play it on the gig just to see what it's like? I said, yes, I would like that. So <laughs> I gave him a set of my strings, and he set up this 60 burst with uh, double whites it was a yeah. beautiful guitar and he brought it to my gig and i played it all night and it freaked me out it was so good and i had never played les pauls on a gig ever yeah. and it was just magic like this guitar was special so at the end of the night he goes why don't you just keep it for the whole tour i said man i don't want to be responsible for this yeah. guitar i gotta carry it everywhere with fourth as much as my house you know and uh but then the more i thought about it, i was like man i'll never get this opportunity again Yes, I'll take it. Yeah. So I did. I just when I'd go to dinner, I'd take it with me, put it next to the table, and <laughs> you know. But I played it for a month with my strings and sweat into it, and it was really magical. So then I didn't know what to do after that because I started playing Les Pauls and nothing came close. You know. Um, what year, when are we talking about this? Sixty. No, oh, what, what, this was like three years ago. So even so, you would be talking about. And it was a re not not refinished all original. No, original sixty. So well. we're upwards of a hundred thousand, probably oh, more. Two hundred thousand. Two hundred thousand. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. Double white PAFs. I mean, it's... but um, so I started thinking what to do. I started trying custom shops and this yeah. and that, and nothing, nothing was even in the in the ballpark. Like, yeah. this thing was light. It almost sounded like a bigger telly. It didn't have any mud like what yeah. you associate with a Les Paul and the neck pickup was clear, you know. And I ended up, next time I was in Germany, borrowing it again for a day and taking it to a friend in Germany who makes really accurate Les Paul copies. Yeah. And I said, make me this. And he did. And that's been my main Les Paul for the last few years. And I play it a lot. Oh, it's actually... I didn't bring it. This is probably the first trip in over a year where it wasn't the second guitar in the bag. For some reason, I wanted to bring a Strat. And normally, the last year or so, it's been yeah. this and the Les Paul with me. Yeah. Does the uh, does the Red Crackle Charvel ever get a, a, an outing? <laughs> it's anymore? still in Florida at my parents' house. I don't have it in L.A., <laughs> so it keeps temptation. I think away that from needs me. to be on the next uh, Josh Smith album. I think just one I, track, just fully torn up. You know. The Floyd Rose, man. I still don't know if I know how to change strings on it now. <laughs> Is it got an original set or something yeah, from 1985? Or Funny story. The first time Derek Trucks ever slept over at my house, because yeah. we were buddies, we had, you know, a hangout. We, he had a Strat, too. He didn't have his SG. He had a Strat, and I had that Charvel. And uh, we tried to change strings on my Floyd Rose, and we, we couldn't get him back on <laughs> once we got him off. It was really sad. Well, you you are perfectly transitioning from from one topic to another now because I I think you know that's probably the the, the bit that that uh, you've been uh, incredibly lucky to collaborate with some of the again some of the other world's most amazing guitar players as yeah. I say you know and that's probably some of the some of the videos that I've ended up watching on YouTube where you where you physically sitting with your jaw on the floor it, you know where there'll be you and Joe Bonamassa on stage and yeah. Kirk Fletcher and um, Eric Gales yeah. I mean it's, it's it's just you know the the, the the blues cruise thing you know it's just <laughs> yeah. like it's just insane but I mean it's 
I know it's not, you know, you can't have like a, a favorite one or anything like that. But, <laughs> um, but who's your favorite? No. <laughs> who's my favorite? It depends on what we're talking about. I have a lot of criteria, you know. Who's the best blues guitar player in the world? Kirk Fletcher is the best blues guitar player in the world. In my opinion. Yeah. You know, is he the best guitar player in the world? No, that's not what we're talking about. Yeah. But if you sat me down and said, I got to listen to slow blues or you're going to die, I want to hear Kirk Fletcher play that slow blues, you know? Yeah. And plus, he's my best friend. I mean, that's my brother, you know? And uh, Joe, Joe is unbelievable guitar yeah. player. But I don't think people realize just how good he is, especially now that it's become fashionable to take shots at him and, yeah. you know, this and that. He has put in so many hours... When I sit down with Joe, all I see is the same thing I did. I see a kid who sat on the edge of his bed till infinity playing guitar, yep. you know, until he got where, somewhere he wanted to be, you know. We He's went, inspiring. We went to see Joe at the Albert Hall at the beginning of last year. And in fact, yeah, I mean, he is really of all those kind of relatively young sort of blues guys I'm, you know when I say relatively I'm not talking about Eric Clapton and all this kind yeah, of thing but yeah, that, yeah. that wave you know he's the only one that's doing the you know 5,000 seater you know I and mean, you've got to hand it to him he's he's, he's an anomaly in that yeah. way he's the only guy at that level yeah. right now doing what he does it's inspiring yeah. as heck yeah because it's also relatively recent yeah he's been doing this his whole life it took yes. quite a while for the payoff you know absolutely that's inspiring to um, me you know and I and I, I'm with you in the sense of I, I can't, I cannot understand it where people talk about him as, you know, having like being soulless or, you know, in terms of, you know, all being very mechanical. Because I sit there going, I mean, I, I sat, we got free tickets from Gibson to do the, the Albert Hall thing. And, and I sat, you know, like as far as I am away from the camera to watching him play. Mm -hmm. And it's like, there's no, pe like, well, it's, it's all turned up tweed yeah, amps, no pedals. guitars, yeah. like one boost pedal or something like that, mm -hmm. which I think is on all the time. And everything from the fingers. I'm not, and he's singing at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, yeah, I mean, I'm... I, he's a, a serious musician, an incredible player yeah. who, you know, has found his own voice and is doing his thing. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's super inspiring. And yeah, we've become really good friends in yeah. the last, you know, five, six years. And... You know, that's been really rewarding. To, to he, He's, you know, he's a great guy. He's at times gone out of his way to mm -hmm. say nice things about me and about Kirk because he likes us. And, yeah. you know, I, I got nothing but no, love for that guy. Super you cool know? guy. We just produced a record together in Nashville for Reese Winans, uh, which was really fun. So Joe and I are the co-producers for Reese Winans' first ever solo album. Oh, good for you. It's pretty cool. I'm trying to remember. There's a there's a track on. Um, I'm rubbish with album names, but it's the one where you've got the, the relatively young girl and the sort of floral kind of album cover oh, over your head. Yeah. Over your head. That's it. Yeah. There's a track on there. I think with where us you together, and Joe are trading off. And yeah. it's like, oh my god. Yeah, we're going at each other. It's just <laughs> ridiculous. The thing that. about that record and that track is that everything is live on that record, so there's no overdubs. Other. So than you're literally vocals. just trading off yeah, each other. Yeah, we're just... that's that's a take. You know, of us with the band live. He was actually, when I told him that's how we were doing it, he was like, uh, I don't know, man. I was like, no, it's live. Whole record. There's no, I didn't play a single guitar overdub on an entire record. You know, so I like that because it's a performance. It's him and I just going yeah, at it. and it's, it's off the scale. I'd love to have seen some... Um you know some YouTube footage of that or something, but I don't think there is any, is there? But, but I like because Joe and I are different enough. Yeah, where we we kind of have our own voice, you yeah. know. But we we all also speak a lot of the same language, so it's a good you know. There's definitely elements in that where you you're completely right. You're kind of there are bits where you can definitely tell it's you, and you can definitely tell it's Joe, and then there's other bits where you're going. I'm not sure which one that is anymore. Well, because then, like, then, then we're like, oh, he played that, I'll play it. You know what I yeah, mean? Or yeah. whatever. You know, that's how it is when you're going at so, your friend, you know. So are there any collaborations left that you haven't done that you'd like to do? That I haven't done? Um, no, I mean, that's a tough one, man. There's people I just want to play with. I want to mm -hmm. play with John Schofield mm -hmm. and Larry Goldings. I really want to play with Larry Goldings, you know. He doesn't even know who I am. I've met him a few times through Landau. You know, he's my favorite, one of my favorite musicians. I want to play with Kenny Garrett one day. He's a right. saxophone player. Yeah, I'm a huge, enormous fan of that guy. <laughs> um, Joe and I are talking about doing a record together with Kirk. Maybe the three of us. Uh, that's the three Musketeers. Yeah, it's a, it's in, we're we're seeing if we can make that happen. Joe is much busier than Kirk and I, so <laughs> so it's 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 making that happen. You know. Uh, 
Gales, I would love to do stuff with him. I wrote him some songs recently. He asked me to write him some songs for his record. He didn't use them, but <laughs> but he he asked, and so I wrote him some songs. And uh, I thought some of that stuff you were doing with the fuzz reminded yeah. me a little of of, of Eric. And the yeah. weird thing is, I I've never really hear people playing quite like him because obviously everything he's playing is. He plays lots of runs differently because he's playing everything he's upside totally down. Different, yeah. He's totally different, yeah. He's an inspiring musician. The thing yeah. about Eric, besides like the chops and whatever, is uh, Eric's one of those guys who when you see him play, it's like uh, like just an open vessel of music. You can yeah. tell he's just in it yeah. and enjoying it. That's what I like to see. He's, yeah. uh, he's 100% Eric. He will <laughs> always be that, you know? And that that's what I like is I like guys who have their voice and they don't compromise sure. they sound like themselves you know for sure have you i'm just trying to think um you mentioned you know growing up with derek and being yeah. in, a, in a in a band i don't i struggling to recall ever seeing the two of you do anything sort of more in more sort of in your adult years nope none no? zero is that just because again he's super busy or just haven't uh, you want the honest answer? I, I don't, don't think he really even knows what I play guitar like these days. <laughs> I don't think he knows what I sound like. I don't think we keep in touch just to say happy birthday and stuff yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. But I'll see him when he comes to LA. I I couldn't tell you if he has any idea what I play like these days. You know, well, maybe he's watching this. Get in touch. What's funny yeah. is I play with. I know. I mean, I've known him so long, and now Tim Lefebvre is his bass player, who I play with all right. the time in LA. Who played on my last record, the jazz one that I have. So I know all those people. I mean, I see them all the time, but I, I, it's been, you know, 20 years since we played together. Wow. I don't think he knows kind of what I do and my thing. Oh, well, he's done well for himself as well. He's done he? incredible, so, yeah. yeah. Another very talented The thing player. about Derek is that even then, at 13, he was the only one I've ever heard. I wasn't like that, where he didn't have certainly not the vocabulary that he had now. But he sounded like that already. Right. He was Derek he right was away. Slide it was even like at thirteen. Well, that's all. Yeah. He yeah. back then he only played slide. That oh, okay. was it. You know. And but he he just had that soul like yeah. right away. Like he sounded like that from day one. Like it was really that was inspiring too. When I first saw him, I was like, wow. Well, yeah. it has been a monumental pleasure having you here talking us through. I, I gear couldn't be more guitars. pleased, man. This is but, great. In term, just to finish up then, so 2018, what what can we expect? I know you're you're here uh, right now to kick off some dates in the UK. Yep. Uh, with our good friend Ariel Posen as well. Yeah. Who's supporting you. We're He's gonna, there every night. Yeah. Double bill. Yeah. We are going to try our best to get this video live up within like 48 hours or two or three days of of, uh, of Josh being here. Really. So there should be another week or so of the tour left to go. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll put a link in the description below where people can find tickets for that. When you're finished in the UK, where, where are you off to next? Uh, where am I off to next? Back to home. And mm -hmm. then actually Kirk and I go on the cruise again, the Bonamassa cruise. It's the last week of February. Right. And first few days of March. So that'll be fun. This, uh, this will be the fourth year in a row we're going on the cruise. And, I think it's uh, a great idea. I mean, what a wonderful way to spend a week just, you know, sailing. Because it's all around the Caribbean, right? It's, this year it's Jamaica, so I've never been to Jamaica. That's cool, you know. So I'm looking nice. forward to that. And nice. uh, So that's right when I get home, pretty much. I also have a record that I have to produce when I get home in March. Uh, and I, I, I just finished my new record. I don't know when it'll be out yet. just depends on if I release it myself. Or, my record deal ended with the label I've been with okay. in Europe. So I'm negotiating some new labels, and yeah, we'll see whether I if I sign a deal with somebody else, they'll be in control of when it comes out. If I put it out myself, it could be out this summer. We'll see. It's oh. done. It's just sitting there. Well, fingers crossed we get to hear that sooner rather than later. But look, man, thank you so much for coming over. Thank you. Please uh, come to the, any shows yes, in the UK. Absolutely. What day is London? Why don't you play them out with... The a, 8th, February 8th February is 8th. London. Oh, well, that'll yeah. be a good one. Why don't you play us out with something that they can kind of expect to hear on, on the tour? Something you can expect to hear. All right.
Yeah. Thanks, man. Thank you, guys. Hey everybody, thanks for watching the Anderton's Guitar YouTube channel. If you're a drummer or a keyboard player or interested in music technology, you might find one of our other channels interesting, and I'll put details of those in the description below. If you want to find out more about the products we've just featured, please click here. If you'd like to buy a t-shirt like this, please click here. If you want to watch another video on our guitar channel, click down here. And to subscribe to our guitar channel, click here. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time.